If I say I'm going to talk about a, revo a revolution in publishing, there are a lot of things that might come to mind for you, and probably they're all going to be different. Am I talking about the battle between traditional academic publishers and outfits like Sci-Hub? Do I mean the technical means of publishing? What the web and Ajax and HTML5 have done to our ideas of what a publication is? Or maybe I'm talking about a revolution in the scientific process, open data, and what that means for the transparency of science. Well, it's no wonder we never stop talking about what it is that digital publishing means. We have at least three major categories of change happening, each of which, taken on its own, would be a, re a revolution in its own right. So today I want to start to pick apart and reflect upon all of these different revolutions from the perspective of some of us, which is to say we academics, who are heavily dependent on electronic publication in our specific and idiosyncratic ways. I'll say up front that I'm not here to advise you on business models or give suggestions on what a service infrastructure should look like, because I think almost all of you will have a better and more informed perspective on these things than I do. But rather, I want to talk about our practices in academia, especially in the digital humanities, how our practices in the whole of academia are sort of broken right now, and how new forms of publication could possibly help to crack open what at the moment is a fairly vicious circle that it's otherwise very difficult for us to break free of. My corner of academia is the digital humanities, and that means also a lot of different things to different people. I could spend an entire talk actually telling you what I think digital humanities is. Uh, but specifically, I work in the sector of digital humanities that likes to do really fun things with computers, things that will push us to engage with questions and problems in, huma in humanities in ways that would otherwise be difficult or impossible to do, in the hope that this will lead us down the paths of inquiry that we simply couldn't travel before in pursuit of better knowledge. You might think of me as a computer hacker who turned into a historian, which is pretty much what I am. Uh, this means that I'm one of those people who are making neat things that no one else has ever made before and hoping that we can make their publication and their sustainability your problem. <laughs> okay, so let's come back to this set of revolutions on our hands, all of which have to do with public access to the knowledge and thought that arises in academic circles. I'm going to put them into three neat and tidy and no doubt overly neat and tidy categories. One is access to the product, the, the product of our knowledge, the fruits of our knowledge. One is access to the input, let's say the seeds of our knowledge. And one is access to the process, which is to say from the seeds to the fruit and everything in between. So the first of these revolutions concerns what I'll define broadly as access to the fruits of research, which in a publishing context this means the things that we write to describe what we did and what we made of it. This is what the academic spring was all about, removing the paywalls in front of research publications. I'll stand up here and say that I am a strong supporter of access to research publications as a public good. The vast majority of universities, especially here in Europe, are publicly funded, and it's your tax money that pays the salaries of us academics. And so what we do all day needs to be transparent to the taxpayer, and ensuring access to our publications is the most obvious way to do that. At the same time, I have to say that when I listen to my fellow academics, I don't hear a lot of acknowledgement of the fact that it does cost money to publish things, and that, especially in the case of electronic publication, the costs are ongoing. We have a real commons problem on the internet in general, which has to do with its decentralized nature and has only been exacerbated by widely available cloud computing. People who don't directly have to pay that cost tend to forget that over and above the cost of the editing and typesetting and distribution and marketing that goes along with properly publishing works, there's a cost associated with hosting content online and making that content available. And then the people who don't understand this then gri gripe about the lack of sustainability of their online publishing practices of digital publication to Dropbox. But the bigger economic problem here is one of mismatched incentives. In academia, and especially in the humanities, we don't tend to care about money, except insofar as we want to pursue our passions and comfort. What we care about much more than the fortune is the fame. We live and die, metaphorically speaking, by our reputation. One of the rather nasty effects of the streamlining, simplification, and systemization of our age is that academic success has been reduced to an absurd extent to three things that form a forceful feedback loop. You get things published, you get those things read, well, actually, 
You make sure the things that you publish are scored highly in metrics that suggest that perhaps they're being read, because it's the metrics that count and not the actual reading. And you win funding grants. Now, this is really quite sad. Some people are natural educators. Others are uninspired when it comes to teaching, but very effective project managers. Some are terrible project managers, but wonderful writers. Some can't write very well, but are great at critical review, at picking apart the holes in what other people wrote. These are all different skill sets. They're all completely necessary for the functioning of higher education and for the research sector. And they're all entirely separate from the ability to do good research, to have those insights in the first place. But our incentive system has reduced more or less everything to these three, these three criteria. Get published. Get good metrics. Use those metrics to win some funding grants. Use the funding grants to get published, etc. And on the basis of this, we have allowed ourselves to be exploited in a massive fashion. I don't think that there is some sort of evil plot of Elsevier or any other academic publisher. It's just the result of some seriously skewed incentives on the academic side, which match poorly with the financial incentives on the publishing side, which means that the reputation gets turned into money. We need the publication system to work, and we don't care too much about money, so we agree to do the reviews for free. After all, a review can count as a publication. We need to demonstrate our ability to game these weird metrics, so we work with the journals that have the systems in place to, the, to do the best sorts of weird metrics, no matter what rights we have to sign over to get there. We need our stuff to be published quickly, so we agree to handle the entire preparation process ourselves up to the point of typesetting. And over time, the publishers have responded in quite natural ways to these incentives. And now there's been an uprising against many of these publishers, but we still have not come close to fixing the broken incentives that gave rise to this problem in the first place. So this discussion of incentives and reputation brings me to another sort of revolution that touches on the possibilities of electronic publication. This one concerns access to information. That is to say, not the fruits of research, but perhaps the seeds of research. Here I'm talking about the open science data movement, the idea that not only our research findings, but also our research data should be made public, which is to say, published. Now, this is a pretty intimidating concept for a lot of academics. What? Publish our data? But then people might use it. Well, yes, say the open science academics or advocates, that is kind of the point. Most research is publicly funded, information likes to be free, and hoarding our knowledge is the opposite of the scientific principles of freedom and access to information that we stand for. Now, I looked up this open, open science movement page on Wikipedia just to see what, what they have to say about it. And according to Wikipedia, the conflict here is between the desire of scientists to have access to shared resources versus the desire of individual entities to profit when other entities partake of their resources. I'm going to come back to this idea of profit in a minute. Now, the open science advocates in saying this do acknowledge a few arguments against the idea, some of which are more made of straw than others. Um, first, there's the danger of information overload, that if we are flooded with data, how will we be able to fish out what's important? How will we find the stuff we need in this vast sea of data? This does strike me as a straw man argument, not least because as the amount of data increases, so the interest in the technology in mining that data increases, and we're not without our tools to cope with this, and the tools are getting better all the time. But, and also because we're already flooded with data as it is, even before open science has become a thing, and, we're, and the universe hasn't exploded yet. Um, so I'll move on to the next one, which is the danger of public misunderstanding. This is an argument that seems very strange to me on the face of it, that people just won't be able to understand what they're seeing, and we should protect their pretty little heads from knowledge that they won't know how to use. Um, though I have to admit that in a world where facts seem to matter less and less in public <laughs> policy and politics, um, there could be some potential here, mainly. 
But also, they talk about the danger of misuse or malicious use of information. This is usually characterized as researchers' fears that they will lose control of how their data is used. Now, the usual picture painted by open science advocates of their opponents is of somewhat small-minded scientists, probably, probably medical researchers or something, where some industry where you get patents, um, who believe that some profit might arise from their data, that this profit is rightfully theirs, but it will be stolen by others unless they guard their data. The implication is that these scientists are putting some nebulous earning potential ahead of the common good, giving in to selfishness. Now, when people hear this argument, and especially when they hear the word profit, they usually think of financial profit, that we researchers, that, that I'm sitting here hoping finally to become rich and famous in academia. Um, but remember that in academia, our currency is not money, it's reputation. And so then this unreasonable greed is transformed into a perfectly reasonable fear. We don't imagine, well, most of us don't imagine, that someone is going to come along and make piles of cash off of our data. We're worried that someone else will come along and make piles of tenure-worthy publications out of our data. Uh, when you hear this argument, rather than imagining a medical professor in the pay of Big Pharma laughing all the way to the bank, to the patent office, you should imagine the postdoc in her final year of funding opening the mailbox to find the 12th rejection letter this year. Or the adjunct lecturer who won't get enough teaching hours this year to cover his electricity bill, certain that if he lets his data go, he's also letting go any fleeting prayer of a publication that could get him job security. Now, I'll stand up here and say that I'm a believer in open science as well as open access to publications, and that I think our data should be out in the open. I support the argument that since public money pays for our work, public access to our work should be a matter of course. I don't have a lot of time for the argument that the information is dangerous in the wrong hands, not least because the wrong hands don't need to rely on meticulous scientific data in order to be dangerous. <laughs> However, it's going to be extremely difficult to convince me to release the manuscript transcriptions that I have spent years of my life working on until or unless I have either got sufficient publication credit from them or had some assurance that tenure-worthy credit will arise from publication of the data itself. Whoa. Tenure-worthy credit arising from publication of research data. That's a nice thought, isn't it? <laughs> now, at this point, I have to speak rather carefully. On the one hand, I've already talked about the broken incentives that plague ac academia, especially where those incentives incorporate arbitrary metrics as a substitute for gauging the scholarly impact of a particular publication. On the other hand, it's precisely the academic publishing sector, whether it's private or public, profit or nonprofit, that has the ready expertise around all matters to do with publication of scientific information, citation practice, measurement of impact, if I'm going to open up my database of historical persons for public consumption, I need it to be taken seriously as an academic publication. I need the citation of a particular entry or a particular query to be something that is provided for in all the major style guides. I need to be assured that the publication of this data will endure somehow, that it will still be useful in 20 years. And well, I mean useful useful in as much as the merits of the existence of the data are useful. Um, and that those who would use this data need to be assured that it's not going to change out from underneath them when they pin their argument on it in their own publications. Now, this isn't something that publishers can arrange all by themselves. The world of academia is going to have to meet you on this more than halfway, uh, particularly where it comes to assigning publication credit to non-traditional forms of publication and especially collaborative forms of publication in fields where collaboration is not necessarily the norm, such as my own field, humanities. Um, but those who are already in academic publishing have a head start in thinking about all of these issues, in understanding the importance of credit as, and recognition as our professional currency, and in knowing how to market yourselves and market your processes and what you do to the sorts of conservative scholars who sit on review panels and hiring committees. Because you, especially for those of you who 
publishers whose imprimatur indicates quality research. Anyone can put a database online. I could put this database online tomorrow, no problem. Um, but it's, it's the publishers who have the power to persuade university professors to take that database seriously. Now this brings me to a third sort of revolution in publishing, which we can think of as access to the process of knowledge creation. This is where it gets rather more technically exciting. So far in this talk, I haven't really been pushing the boat out very far in terms of the forms an electronic publication can take. We've gone from books and journal articles about as far as databases. In the process, I have intimated that a collection of data is not usually given the same level of academic credit as a book or a journal article. It absolutely isn't. The usual perception is that a real contribution to research is analytical and has a conclusion, whereas it doesn't take research brilliance to make a lot of meticulous observations. A typical perception and is something like this, and I found a diagram that looked exactly like this when I was just hunting around for pictures um, explaining the scientific method, but really, it says more than it thinks it's saying. Because you notice how comparatively rare and thus apparently valuable that conclusion bit at the top is? Supporting data, apparently, is a dime a dozen, but conclusions are the gold. This is, this is the general perception of, of academic science. And this sort of attitude is completely natural in a world where only publications and metrics count. And it's a symptom of our skewed incentives. It opens a pretty obvious get famous quickly scheme, because remember, we're talking about reputation and not money. And that's to make sure that you're up at the top there, that other people are doing all of that supporting data evidence, maybe making some points, maybe in some, in some, pa in some conference paper or poster session somewhere. And you want to be the one who's actually gathering it all and tying it up into a neat, tidy conclusion and giving it to a publisher. Moreover, this leaves an enormous gray area in the scholarly space between observation and conclusion. Um, this thing that here is labeled main points, but is basically everything from putting stuff in the database, deciding how to put stuff into the database, um, deciding what you're going to do with the stuff in the database, um, designing an experiment if you're doing experimental science or coming up with, coming up with something to, to think about and test if you're doing the humanities sort of science. Um, and a lot of my own academic work has been in the field of textual scholarship. And in textual scholarship, we do these things called critical editions. Uh, that's, that's our primary output. And those critical editions lie directly in the middle of this gray area. This is what a critical edition looks like. So the idea, especially for, for ancient and medieval texts, is that you have a bunch of manuscript copies of some text. None of the manuscript copies are perfect. Uh, so you have to collect as many of the manuscript copies as you can, uh, probably transcribe them. You certainly have to collate them. That means that you have to match up where the, words, where the individual words match throughout all the different manuscripts. There are different ways to do this. I like to do it the digital way, quite obviously, but, um, but you can also do it by hand on, on, on index cards if you like. Um, and then you have to go through the collation, make some deductions about which manuscripts get you closer to the earliest state of the text that can possibly be recovered, and go through and reconstruct what might be what, in your opinion, or in your, in your scholarly judgment, the earliest state of this text. When you're dealing with things like ancient Greek poetry, that is, that is quite a technical and artistic challenge even, because you have to look at things like poetic meter, you have to look at things like the line lengths, you have to look at things, you, you have to think about scansion and all of these, all, and, and you know, very picky things about grammar, and all of these very exacting things. Um, in medieval step prose, it's a little bit different because you don't necessarily expect the original author to have been a grammarian, but the basic idea is the same. You have to collect all of this data, you have to sort through it, and then what you produce is a text. And it's not your own text. It's a text that you think someone else wrote many hundreds of years ago. And the way you do a critical edition then is that you have the text up top, but you also have this apparatus down at the bottom 
the critical apparatus is the place where you put all of your data. That is an encoded way of, so this critical apparatus, which I'm not going to read out, and it's a bit, you can see that it's a small bit at the bottom, it will tell you where the manuscripts are different. It will tell you, well, where I have, where I have this um, Melimu here, manuscript V has something different. And so the ideal of a critical edition is that you are not just giving your own argument about the text. You're not just standing up here and saying, this is the way I think the text is. Um, you're saying, well, this is the way I think the text is, and here's my evidence. And if you want to disagree with me, go for it, because I've given you, the, I've given you my data. And so you publish this data and this process and this argument all in the same book. And people have been doing this for hundreds of years. It's, got, it's, it's long a precursor to open notebook science. But the problem is that for decades at least, there has been a credit problem associated with producing a critical edition, which kind of makes sense in light of the stuff that I've been saying. Even in the 1980s, you can find textual scholars bemoaning the habit of tenure committees to count a critical edition as only half a book when they're totting up the number of publications that, that a tenurable scholar has. But this is the thing about a critical edition, it's data and it's analysis. And it's just like open notebook science. A good critical edition is essentially a paragon of this. It presents the data, the reasoning process, and the conclusion all in one volume for any interested reader to follow along and assess for themselves. Meanwhile, there's another long-standing debate within the digital humanities over the use of computational methods and to what extent these computational methods constitute a black box. What does it mean when I write a software program that my fellow humanists can't understand in order to, answer, in order to help me along with my research? Black boxes have tended to be seen as a normal feature of the experimental sciences. Once a hypothesis has been tested and accepted as a theory, its use toward the investigation of other hypotheses can proceed generally without controversy. If the theory behind the black box is later called into question, then the black box may be unboxed, so to speak, and further investigated. In the humanities, they really don't like black boxes, or at least, they don't like the black boxes that they recognize as black boxes. This is one rationale for the deep suspicion that many people in the humanities hold towards the digital humanities. They don't understand what our computer programs are doing, and they don't have the skills to investigate it, to read the source, and to find out. Of course, it's very easy to sit here and act superior and tell them that they all just need to go learn how to program because it's a useful life skill and without learning to program, you're just not gonna get anywhere in the world. But that's not actually really the problem because even a programmer can have a very hard time following the logic of a computer program that someone else wrote. So because of this suspicion towards code as a black box in the humanities, what is it doing with my data? How, how can I follow the process if I don't understand what the, what the algorithm is doing? And because computer programmers also have a terrible reputation for writing documentation for their code, for not writing documentation for their code, and if they do, not keeping it updated in tandem with the further development of the code, we can essentially no longer justify doing digital humanities without some form of an open notebook format. Yeah, oops, stay there. Um, the best known of these, which I suspect many of you will have seen by now, is the Jupyter Notebook. This is a really nice environment for an ever-growing number of interpreted programming languages. Um, it lets you mix data and code and explanation into a single visually neat format that someone can read and follow along. This thing, it's a publication. It's unmistakably a publication. You can't argue that this isn't a publication because this is a publication. It can be read. The argument can be followed. The method can be analyzed. It also happens to be an executable code environment. Now that makes things interesting, doesn't it? Specifically, it brings home a problem that has been circling around us for a while. For people who are concerned with the archiving and the sustainability of research outputs. We've talked about different forms of online publication, and we talk about the archival of research data. 
But we've known, even as we discuss it, that archival of dynamic content, and especially of software and interfaces, is basically out of the question. Notebooks like Jupyter are not immune from these concerns. I've already had to convert some notebooks from an old format once in the last year or so in a way that is not backwards compatible with the old Jupyter system. And now I hear that there is another system called Beaker that's coming along whose, whose main claim to fame is that they want to allow multiple code environments in the same notebook so that you can have a notebook that has some Ruby code and some Python code and maybe something from R all in the same notebook. I never said supporting a publication like this was going to be easy. But if we're going to rev revolutionize electronic publishing in this sense, we're going to have to find a way. It might involve a selected archive of supported Jupyter kernels. It might involve publishing notebooks in specific environments available to a system like Docker, where you can control the entire operating environment in which a particular code is run and archive those things. Some, and maybe these Docker images will be maintained in a public archive over the long term. It might be some technological means that I haven't heard of yet because it's not going to be invented until three years from now. Uh, I did promise not to stand up here and tell you how to do your jobs. I don't know how this could best be done. But this particular revolution is upon us. And for the last part of my talk, I'm going to argue that this aspect of the revolution is critical to the digital humanities in particular, and we're going to need the help of electronic publishing to pull it off. So thanks to these open executable notebook formats, we're getting to the point where executable code is part and parcel of a scholarly argument that looks more like this period, pyramid, that you've got some data and some conclusions and some evidence and some observations all in there in different places, where each, each where it supports what you're trying to do, um, and helps, and you can even peek inside the black box if you like. It's not just a description of the algorithm. It's a full environment, complete with data, in which the argument can be tested, in which the computational methods used in service to a question in the humanities can be removed from the black box that they have effectively been packed into until now, in which the entire process, from data collection to selection to model construction to analysis to conclusion, is brought together in a coherent feat of rhetoric. Human humanists love rhetoric. Open notebook science is a movement that is growing in pretty much every field that employs computational method. But of all these fields, the ones that are not primarily governed by experimental scientific method, for example, the humanities, and particularly that collection of subfields under the umbrella term digital humanities, are absolutely going to have to revolve around this convergence of algorithm and argument. Now, I think this is really exciting. I've had to, I, you note that I've had to adopt, ad adapt the open science logo a bit to say that it's not just about lab and experiments, it's also about books in the humanities. Don't forget us, guys. Um, but people have been asking for 30 years now, what's the point of digital humanities? What does digital humanities actually add to the way humanities are done? How are we going to change the way humanities research works? And now finally, after all these years of writing about it and pontificating, and using all sorts of fantastic code only to be told that it doesn't count as part of the argument because it's a black box. And it certainly doesn't count towards our publication portfolio because it's not a publication. The technology has moved in a direction that will actually allow us to publish our code and our data as part of our argument. That's so cool. But this is where we need you guys. We need your expertise to manage the publication process of these sorts of outputs. We need your collaboration in finding a solution for the sustainability. We need you to use the capital that you have built up over the years as arbiters of quality and reputation to get these works disseminated, evaluated, and recognized as scholarly works worthy of a place in the academy. I'm not going to stand up here and say that we are depending on you to fix the broken incentives that plague ac academia, because the vast majority of that work needs to be done by the academy itself. But there are a lot of us, especially here in digital humanities, who would be ever so grateful if, by this means and by any other means, if you would lend a hand. Thank you very much. There is, of course, happy to take questions and comments. Don't be shy.
<laughs> I'll try one. Thank you for a very, very good talk. I really enjoyed it. The, the question I wanted to raise in this vision of particularly going after the, uh, the process of uh, the research activity is um, how do you organize a debate about a process which flows on constantly? How, what means of stabilization, something equivalent to an article, in, in effect, uh, could you inject into these publications so as to really allow for a, a, a community to start debating about what has been temporarily uh, offered as a temporary conclusion, temporary synthesis? How do you do that? Right, so what you're, you're talking about the fact that process is an ongoing thing, and we, when we make these publications, we're taking a snapshot of it. Um, I don't think I have any... I don't, I don't know that this is going to change the way process works in that sense, because even a normal article written and published and distributed as a PDF, that is taking an implicit snapshot of an ongoing process anyway. So I suppose I would say it's kind of the same thing, only we're making these, this snapshot process more exposed and more open to, more open to poking at and, and experimentation and, and criticism than when we describe it in paragraphs in an article. Um, depending, you know, and of course, this also depends on whether the person who wrote those paragraphs in an article is making clear what their process was or if they're obscuring what their process was, but it's very hard to obscure code in Jupyter, it can be done, but um, you have to have some particular talents for that, which most people in, in um, most people who program these things probably don't have. So I would say they're, they're kind of two different things to me. You know, there, there, is this, there is this ongoing debate about process, and that's happening anyway, but I think this is going to make it a little bit easier to see what, what is inside those snapshots that would otherwise just be journal articles. Can I come back briefly? Okay. What would be the principle of coherence that would be inside the creation of a snapshot? That is, speaking as in the humanities, um, it's still going to have to be a rhetorical argument. You're going to have to ha incorporate this interpretation of the results and drive that towards a conclusion in the way that in the humanities it's always been done. In the experimental sciences, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be that um, it's going to be not a million miles from publishing a paper that, that gives out the logical symbols of your algorithm, only you've now expressed those logical symbols in source code that someone can actually run. Um, I think it's, wh where to me it's going to make a difference is in the humanities, because we don't, I think in the humanities, we don't really talk enough about method, especially when it comes to incorporating data. Um, and I think the more we can expose what our method is, the more we can actually talk about it and move that process forward. It, to me, it feels almost less critical for the sciences because they kind of already know how to have these conversations, but for the humanities, it's, it seems more important. Thank you very much, Tara. That was a great presentation. Uh, my question is, sir, uh, it seems like uh, traditional approaches to research assessment and evaluation are something that really holds us back. And uh, uh, have you had any discussions at your university how those approaches could be changed, how, for example, your STEM up web project could be considered as your, I don't know, research output, sir? Or maybe in, in, right. in your communities, whether you had any discussions about new approaches to research assessment and evaluation? There have certainly been discussions within the community of digital humanities. Most of these discussions are taking place in the United States, where tenure committees and tenure boards are more of a, more of a live or die thing, and where they have really much more problem with, with too much of the academic workforce being adjunct than we have in Europe. In my, in my particular case, I think in the first place I have managed to sidestep most of these conversations um, because in the second place I have been extremely lucky that informally for consideration of hiring 
it seems that the work that I have done on Seven Web has been counted as something, as an output that I've made. So it doesn't work so well for funding applications. You know, the ERC still think that I've done nothing of note. But um, when it comes to getting the jobs, I've managed to be able to convince the hiring committees or other people have been able to manage to convince the hiring, hiring committees on my behalf that this stuff is actually substantial. So it is, it is working and it is changing, but I have to admit that I have had an astonishing streak of luck in this regard, and I'm not quite sure how that happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for this talk. Um, I have a following question. In the, um, for the digital humanities, uh, in the moment, very focused on editorial science or lexical governance science, and from that, your example of this edition is very plausible. Um, you can show and publish the process from data and conclusions and so on. But this is only one part of the digital humanities. If you switch to the hermeneutical um, researchers on this field, it is more complicated to show this data flow or to show this data-driven work. What is your perspective on this? Um, okay, it's true that I took critical editions because they're, they're quite an easy target, as it were. Um, the other forms of digital humanities, I mean, as I say, I am part of the branch of digital humanities where we write code to do interesting things and then we, we interpret the results and publish those conclusions. I think anything like that can more or less fit into a notebook. Um, there are systems that are bigger and more complicated that would not necessarily fit into a notebook. For example, any, a system like StemaWeb I'm not sure that I could fit an entirety, the entirety of StemaWeb into a notebook. But what I could do is take the parts of the algorithm that drive StemaWeb and put that into a kind of format, in, into a sort of format. It, it's, it's not a million miles away from commenting your code, actually. This is one of the reasons that, um, this is one of the reasons that Jupyter notebooks were such an obviously good idea, because you're writing what you're doing, and then you do it, and then you write what you're doing, and you do it, and the format supports that. Um, so, I'm not going to say that everything needs to be published as a notebook, but I, I am going to say that when you have something that is a notebook where you can explain what you're doing and then do the example, and that might mean, that might mean querying a prosopography graph database, it might mean doing, doing data mining on an enormous NLTK corpus, it might mean, um, it might mean um, taking a bunch of archaeology data and, and, doing, and doing some particular, running some particular model on that. But the point is you have to tell them what the model is and you have to let them see inside the model to some extent. So I think it's, it doesn't have universal application, but it, I think we could, it's definitely something that we need to do and that will help to open these black boxes. Do you have someone up front that, yeah. Um, I'm standing for a small group of university press publishers and those university presses are very close to researchers, at least this is what we want, because we don't see ourselves riding the wave of being forced to exploit symbolic capital like the legacy publishers. And the question is, where could we start tomorrow? Because obviously um, those scholarly friendly publishers are absolutely willing to come along on the road but as we are small, we don't really have a lot of technical power to innovate. But tell us where to jump in, and we're ready, I think. Uh, I, as I say, I, I, can't, I can't stand up here and tell you guys how to do your jobs, because I'm probably going to sound pretty ignorant if I do. But if I could give the very easy answer, um, let, not, I suppose not me, but the colleague who lent me his notebook for this purpose, let him give you his notebook tomorrow for an academic article and, and arrange some reviews for it. Could you do that? <laughs> I'm not going to say anything without my director. <laughs> but, but, okay, but you know, that, that's the sort of simple thing that we could start with. You know, if someone walked up to you with that kind of format of publication and said, this is how it works in a web browser, can you publish it? Okay, I take this as a start. <laughs> yeah. to, find the resources to start to look together with yeah. digital humanities scholars. That would be great. Yep. Keep them up here. Thank you, Tara. It was really a really stimulating talk. Thank you very much. 
I was struck by your interesting remark in response to Irina's questions about uh, how the hiring committee recognize your work, but the funding body, the assessment bodies do not. Uh, and you're not lucky, you're very good at what you do, and your colleagues recognize that. And I think it's credit to people like yourself who educate other colleagues about what you do that allows this kind of understanding uh, so that you can continue to do the kind of interesting work that you do. But there is a big gap between those who hold the power of funding and assessment and our community of scholars who practice this. So how, I mean, I, I know you wouldn't, let me force you to venture into that, force closing that gap. How, how do we begin to educate those make yeah. decisions? In a way, I think it's, it's even harder than that because, the, as you say, I've had much better luck with hiring committees than I have with, with funders. And the reason, in my view, for that is because funding has so much more... I should say, first of all, because I'm looking for, you know, I've been looking for positions in the digital humanities for which there are a higher percentage, of, you know, higher ratio of positions to qualified candidates than there are in, let's say, Armenian studies. If I had been looking in Armenian <laughs> studies, I would be done. Um, and so that's, that's been one way in which I have indeed been lucky. Thank you, thank you for your remark, but I, I have also been lucky. Um, and in... But when it comes to the, the big funding pools, the problem is simply one of scarcity. I was, speaking to, I was speaking to an Oxford tutor at some point who was expressing despair over, over how little funding they have for how many qualified scholars. And he said, you know, when we, get, when we get 300 applications for one fellowship, then I may as well just take, just draw a circle on the high street, take all of the applications to the top of Maudlin Tower, throw them off, see which ones land in the circle, and then read those. <laughs> because there's just no better way of, of choosing. So the, this, in a way, it's, it's, not, it's not even as, as easy as I was suggesting in my talk, because the biggest problem we have is one of forced scarcity, scarcity where we have only one, you know, only 2% of applications can be funded or something ridiculous like that. And then when you have so many applications to read as a reviewer for a funding body, and you have so few that can actually make the cut, you end up having to do really harsh and arbitrary things, such as looking at publication metrics, in order to bring it down to a number that you can actually read within the three weeks that you have to review. So it's, it's, really, it's really a problem of scarcity. And what I'm, what I'm standing here and suggesting is that in a fair world, we should be evaluated on all of the different things that goes into making a good academy, and we're, sh we're shooting ourselves in the foot by only concentrating on this one thing. But the reason we're only concentrating on this one thing is because we're working in such an environment of scarcity that we don't feel that we have any choice. And that is something that is bigger than me or you or, you know, even a collection, even, you know, this conference plus the Digital Humanities Conference I'm going to tomorrow put together. It's something that has to be suggested on that society level. And that's where I start wondering where we can start. Uh, thanks very much for the talk, very interesting. Um, you called on publishers to help with this new form of publication, new form of scholarly resources and outputs. Uh, what role do you think uh, cultural heritage institutions or um, memory institutions could also play in broadening the basis of publication for things like annotations, transcriptions and so forth? That's a very good and interesting question and that delves into the question of who is running these digital archives. Who is keeping these Docker? You know, who is keeping the library of these Docker images alive that can be used? Um, what does it mean? You know, when a publisher publishes something, are they using their own service servers, or are they handing it over to cultural heritage institutions to run on their own equipment? That is an enormous infrastructure question. I have no idea. <laughs> um, it's it's one of those things that it it ties into the different. You know, the, here we're getting into the, the money and the, the infrastructure funding and to some extent the profit motives and sometimes the nonprofit just keeping oneself afloat. That is, that's a huge question. It's a very good question and one that I'm completely unqualified to answer. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm just going to finish on a very sort of probably 
um, simple question, but listening to all the questions, it probably ties in. So you've talked about the process that repeats. You've talked about 30 years ago, what happens, and you ended by saying, you know, please support. So the question I think is, from your experience, do you think there's a, we should focus on one thing as a catalyst? Or do you think that little things will equate to some change happening that will go out of this uh, sort of sine curve thing that keeps happening over the years? What do you think? That's a good question. I would have to estimate the pressures either way. I suppose where I would want to start is having publishers encourage their scientific committees to consider something non-traditional to review, for example, because it is the, it's the, the, the reputation and the publication credit comes to some extent from getting good reviews on the stuff that you produce. And so one, one way to sort of push, and I don't know if it would work because I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have a good estimate of the different pressures that are, that are in play here. But for example, if, if someone comes with a database or an online edition of a text or a Jupyter notebook of something, you know, then it might be worth finding a sympathetic person on a, on a scientific committee for, for a journal series or a book series and say, you know, if we, wanted to pub if we wanted to publish something like this, if we worried about the technical details and just made the review your problem, do you, do you think you could find someone to review this? <laughs> for example. Thank you. We can move on. So thank you again, Tara, for your excellent speech. I have a little present for you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you.